Jeffrey Walensky came up with a new theory of planet formation. So he did what a lot of young enthusiasts would do if they were in his shoes. He wrote to a prominent college to see if he could get someone interested in it. Not surprisingly, the scholars didn't know what to do with it. So they told him to go and publish his theory in a respectable journal. Well, like so many rational thinkers out there, good old Jeff quickly realized that the journals are not very receptive to new ideas, especially if they debunk the religion of mathematical physics. The people who read the journals and the popular so-called science magazines have already been conditioned to the nonsense of relativity and quantum. They are content to continue reading about such poppycock as warp space, space-time, Big Bang, dark energy, and black holes for the rest of their lives. Journal editors know this, and they don't want to disappoint their customers. Therefore, if you want to listen to something new today, you have no choice but to see it through YouTube. There is simply no other channel for a rational, independent thinker to expose his ideas to the public. Having nowhere to go, Jeff instead decided to join our scientific group. He told us his theory. And what a theory it is. Here I will publish the essence of this extraordinary insight in simple terms, because the theory is barely two months old, and we're still developing many parts of it. The purpose of the instant video is merely to introduce an outline to the lay public. Orthodoxy holds that a solar system forms when a cloud of gas condenses and begins to rotate like a skater, picking up speed as she spins. Material is primarily drawn to the center of the cloud and eventually becomes a star like our sun. Smaller bundles of gas and particles nucleate into planetesimals, or protoplanets. This entire process takes many millions of years. According to the mathematical establishment, the Earth is a little over four billion years old and was born more or less simultaneously with the Sun. One problem that the mathematicians tried to resolve over the years is why it is that the large gaseous Jovian planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are far from the Sun, whereas the small solid terrestrial planets such as Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are on the inside. They concluded that the solar wind blew light materials such as hydrogen and helium gases outwards leaving the inner planets with heavier elements such as iron, nickel, and lead. But then the question arises as to how the iron and nickel got mixed in with the primordial gas soup in the first place. After all, iron is the most abundant element on our planet, forming its core and sprinkled all the way to its surface. Indeed, the core of Mercury, Venus, Mars, the Moon, and other celestial objects are also thought to be made of iron. The mathematicians theorized that very heavy elements, such as iron, require hydrogen to be compressed in stars significantly larger than our sun. You absolutely need greater gravitational pressures to create elements as heavy as iron. Our sun is a relatively small factory, a mom and pop store. It can in the best of cases produce elements as heavy as carbon and oxygen. It takes a star eight to ten times as massive to produce heavier elements such as iron and nickel. The official party line is that iron is more likely produced in megastars that explode into what are called supernovas. One writer synthesizes the worldly wisdom for us. Supernovas are the source of many of the heavy elements such as iron, cobalt, nickel, titanium, silver, and gold that we find on Earth. The Earth contains material from many supernovae that occurred before our solar system was born. This conclusion is a bit hard to swallow because supernovas are quite rare, happening every 500 years or so. 
did the relatively few supernovas create and then spit out all the iron from distant regions into our neighborhood? Does all the iron that we see in celestial objects scattered throughout the solar system have its origin in distant stars? Another question that popped up is how do celestial objects manage to be so spherical? The mathematicians replied that particles, rocks, and other debris in the primordial gas collided and stuck together electrostatically. Little by little, these agglomerations clumped into bigger, irregular snowballs, which after a certain size drew in even more matter through gravity. The mathematicians theorized that the heat from the collisions and from radioactive material melted these rocks to form a fluid, a process known as the iron catastrophe. Heavier elements such as iron sank to the center, whereas lighter elements rose to the surface. It was gravity which molded the fluid mass into a perfectly round, differentiated ball. In order to justify the moon, the mathematicians theorize that before the Earth had time to solidify, an anonymous rock, fortunately, splattered the liquid mass and created the moon. Hadn't it been for that timely collision, our beloved planet would not have had a sister. Let's now look at the theory that relativists don't want you to hear. A star like the Sun releases gases and other material radially from its surface in what is called the solar wind. The solar wind makes the volume of the heliosphere increase at the expense of the highway of intragalactic matter as it constantly pushes the cocoon enveloping the sun further out. As the heliosphere expands, it engulfs existing celestial objects such as the Earth and Jupiter, which are lying in its path around the Milky Way. In other words, the planets of the solar system were not formed by the primordial gases that formed the sun, as orthodoxy argues, but were there long before the sun ever appeared. According to Jeff's theory, the sun is one of the last, if not the last, member of the solar system. Now, Jeff doesn't incorporate gravity into his theory, and here we part company. I think gravity makes more sense to explain how the Sun induced these existing celestial objects to orbit around it. I propose that all planets of the solar system were gradually incorporated gravitationally as the heliosphere expanded. A new star like the Sun may pick up a stray brown dwarf, a failed star, a ball of gas that did not have enough matter to ignite, such as Jupiter. It is also quite possible that the large Jovian gaseous planets were indeed born with a sun. But then the question arises as to where the terrestrial planets and the moons and the asteroids came from. How did they come into being? Why are they so round? Why do they have heavy metal cores surrounded by ever lighter shells? Mr. Walensky has a shocking answer ready, which has to make you think. He replies that the Earth is a cinder of what was once a star. The Earth is a very old star that has exhausted all of its fuel. The Earth is what is known as a black dwarf. The new star may eventually swallow some of these planets which in this way contribute their heavy dead matter to the next generation of stars. Jeff's incredible insight enables me to finally explain phenomena that troubled me since my days in high school. How can a small object the size of the asteroid Ceres or Saturn's moon Mimas be so spherical? They only measure a few kilometers across. Why is it that Ganymede is differentiated and has a nucleus made of iron, whereas its brother Callisto is undifferentiated and made of lighter elements? Weren't these siblings born from the same parents? It could be argued that the solar wind pushed the gases of the inner planets outwards, but this wouldn't explain why Jupiter's core, which was supposedly born at the same time as its satellite Ganymede, has no iron. 
One would think that the iron and nickel produced in distant furnaces would have sprinkled the primordial gases of the solar system more or less uniformly. And why are some round celestial objects such as Neptune's moon Triton and Pluto covered by a nitrogen atmosphere? The answer is that we are staring at stars that had different sizes when they were active. All of these now dead stars preceded the birth of the solar system and gaseous planets such as Jupiter and Neptune by billions of years. They were engulfed in the orbits of gas giants when these balls of gases came into being. The Earth is encapsulated in a cloud of oxygen gas, whereas our smaller neighbors, Venus and Mars, are enveloped in a thin mantle of CO2. Why? The answer is that after a star sheds its gaseous shell of hydrogen and helium in a nova, its surface now consists of lighter elements such as carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. The carbon of which you are made of was not manufactured in a distant star the size of our sun, which spit that debris into our neighborhood. It was homegrown, manufactured by the now dead star that became the Earth. Because the Earth had sufficient gravity, it retained the oxygen in the form of gas. Venus and Mars instead had their oxygen combined with carbon, which built a layer of CO2. And what about the Moon? The Moon and the Earth were probably a binary star system. Each member eventually shed its skin and the system ended up as a planet and satellite. Perhaps you do not agree with Mr. Walensky, or perhaps you find many holes in his theory. But every groundbreaking proposal of this caliber deserves to have its day in court. Of course, Jeff's theory suggests that the universe is much older than the Big Bang Theory says. So it would be a wonder if the pure censorship boards of the religion of relativity would allow this material to reach the public. You would never be exposed to such radical ideas because the mathematicians have already sifted them for you. Thank mm -hmm. you.